Mission Pluto. Washington University's Bill McKinnon is part of the science team involved in this historic mission. Dr. Bill McKinnon's heart has been with Pluto since the beginning. He explains he's one of a dozen people in the initial push for Pluto. At first it was basically just the, the modest number of people who were actually interested in Pluto and sometimes we called ourselves the Pluto underground kind of just just for fun so we kept working working for this moment in 2006 the new Horizons space probe is launched heading for Pluto and the Kuiper belt as part of NASA's science team McKinnon had a hunch that Pluto could prove extraordinary but admits he could have been wrong this was the only way to know for sure. And just in time, a few months into New Horizons' journey, Pluto, the planet, was reclassified as a dwarf planet. The IAU, the International Astronomical Union, reclassified Pluto. Which, of course, since we were flying, they couldn't stop us. But it could have been a problem, sort of politically, if we had been reclassified in 2005 or 2002, you know, while we were working on the mission. But, you know, it's like Pluto doesn't care, personally. I mean, it doesn't affect anything that happened in 2015 during the flyby. So Pluto wasn't offended by... No, well, <laughs> I think it blew a raspberry at Neptune, but I don't know. <laughs> Unstoppable now and still hoping for something big from the dwarf planet, McKinnon had a lot of time to think. He waited nearly 10 years for the probe to travel more than 3 billion miles. And then the day came, the flyby, July 14th, 2015, a day that proved unforgettable as Pluto blew McKinnon away. And now the dwarf planet is bigger than ever. I knew it was going to be good, but I didn't know it was going to be insanely great. It exceeded everyone's expectation. It even exceeded Alan's expectations, Alan Stern, because he's the PI and he was always, he was always the rah-rah guy. Like, this is going to be the greatest thing. But even he was blown away. It was just, uh, it was a peak experience, probably the highlight of my professional career. You know, scientifically, it was the, it was the greatest moment. And of course, it, it kept on giving because even though, even though it looked great on the 14th, what really happened is then after after we passed by and took all that data, then we could actually start sending back high resolution pictures. At first they were lossy, just so we could get some things down, but eventually we transitioned to send, sending back the, the, the whole data, like lossless, compressed. And they continued receiving data from the flyby for well over a year. In this time, McKinnon says Pluto is becoming more amazing as more data is analyzed. McKinnon published his findings so far about Pluto's churning landscape, the changing face of Pluto, Pluto's nitrogen ice surface, and how a large section of its solid nitrogen surface is renewed by a process called convection. It's just basically heat from below is carried by solid matter on the Earth and in other planets. Inside, it's hot, and so the mantle is convecting, and that's why we have plate tectonics. The surface of the Earth is moving. On Pluto, there's this giant basin, and it's filled with you know, miles of solid nitrogen and solid methane and solid carbon monoxide. And there's enough heat leaking out of Pluto because it's actually two-thirds rock in composition totally and there's radioactive elements in it that decay and they generate heat. And this heat has to get out. And basically they slowly rising blobs of solid nitrogen, they rise up to the surface and they spread and then they descend. And it's all moving at a few centimeters a year, you know, a couple of inches a year. New Horizons data provides evidence that the one thing that McKinnon long expected seems to be a strong possibility. But Pluto is big enough that it could have an ocean on the inside, an ocean of liquid water underneath its ice shell. A liquid ocean, a hidden ocean underground. If you try to imagine slicing Pluto, like a giant melon, slice it all the way through, you have all the weird ices on, on the surface, nitrogen ice, and then there's an ice shell, a water ice shell, and then there's a rock core. And there could be an ocean of liquid water with salt and other goodies in it, wrapped around that core underneath the ice, you know, ice floats. So, but that water could be in contact with rock, and that's one of the places on the Earth where life thrives, 
on active, geologically active vent areas on the Earth's seafloor. So then life on Pluto? Yeah, we're talking about microscopic kind of thing, not space squid <laughs> kind of thing. Analysis of the flyby data continues, so McKinnon says there's more to come. And there's more New Horizons is exploring. We don't know where the Kuiper Belt ends. We don't know how many new worlds exist out there. We're, this is an unknown part of the solar system, basically, until the last you know, 20, 20, 25 years. And this is our first foray. The New Horizons spacecraft visited the Pluto system, and it's on its way to a smaller Kuiper Belt object. And that rendezvous will occur on New Year's Day 2019. But is this it for Pluto exploration? Interesting, you should add. <laughs> We're just forming an internal committee to like talk about what to do next. So the question is, what do you follow this with? Do you, do you want to build a, a kind of clone of the New Horizons machine and send it to other dwarf planets? Or do you want to build something that might actually go to Pluto and stay there? There are other dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt. They even have names like Eris and Haumea and Make Make. It's like someday, maybe sometime later this century, other machines will visit these worlds and they'll have, they'll be different. They'll be doing different things.